this steely gaze is a master of survival. The saltwater crocodile, or salty. Australian salties don't just live by the sea. They inhabit two vastly different worlds. From a muddy tidal estuary to a paradise of fresh water. In this place of richness and plenty, there is a season of hope for new life. But its riches are an illusion. Soon this sanctuary will become a death trap set by the menacing heat of the sun. From fire to floods, this landscape launches endless challenges, but through them all, salties survive. Australia's far north is crocodile territory. For more than 200 million years, crocodiles have successfully hunted where land meets water. From estuaries and rivers across the world, they have watched the mighty dinosaurs come and go. Salties first reached Australia from Asia. For at least four million years, they kept to the coast of the far north. But just 8,000 years ago, all of that changed. A rising sea created an enormous coastal swamp, greatly expanding the saltwater crocodile's territory inland. The tidal rivers that meander through this landscape became highways to unknown worlds and untried opportunities. Saltwater crocodiles are loners and fiercely territorial. This 10-year-old female has recently won a space on the river. Her neighbors are all females except for the one large male who also lays claim to this area. Staking one's claim is essential here, for only territory holders will breed, and only then if they can keep their place on the riverbank. Females visually isolate their nests. The more vegetation along the river, the more females, with the biggest holding the best territory. Life on the river is a relentless struggle, which begins when salties are very young. Hatchlings gather together to avoid attack from predators, but the rivalries which will one day split the group are already at work here. They practice death rolls. Soon they will be used with lethal force to tear the limbs off large prey or rivals in battles for territory. Most hatchlings won't live long enough to enter the highly dangerous river hierarchy. Instead, they'll make just another meal for some larger cousin. Salties are supreme opportunists. Our female is aware of a new source of food in her territory and makes her way toward it. Another female stands in the river snacking on seafood, small fish and prawns delivered on the incoming tide. The size of the prey doesn't seem to matter. Crocs will make a satisfying meal of almost anyone on the riverside, from mud crabs 
to mammals. Surprisingly, small prey like tiny mud skippers occupy much of a salty's hunting time. With relatively small stomachs, crocodiles need far less food to live and grow than warm-blooded animals. They're highly efficient at converting food into energy and muscle. Salties are attuned to the river and soon discover that a colony of small red flying foxes have set up a new roost nearby. Flying foxes are nighttime diners. During daylight, they set up camp wherever the best fruit trees are. The smell and noise of their latest roost has attracted our female. Salties mainly feed at night, but they will adjust their schedules if opportunity comes by day. Moving closer, she adopts a hunting profile. Any animal that lives on or near the riverbank is in great danger. Our young female is now in fine condition, and if she breeds this season, it will be her first time. The lives of all animals at the top end of Australia are dominated by the seasons. the rains will bring changes to the salties. It is a time of extreme humidity. The big males become restless and highly aggressive. They patrol up and down their section of river. Smaller males adopt a low profile to avoid being maimed or killed. During what's known as the wet, a big male croc is a formidable killing machine. His only challenge comes when he oversteps a boundary, trespassing on the territory of an equally large male. Be it accidental or deliberate, his presence will not be tolerated. This belligerent behavior is driven by the need to breed. But in order to mate, the beast must first be tamed. By raising her chin out of the water, our female salty signals submission in the body language of courtship. Unless he is calmed, the young female could easily be killed. She blows bubbles along the length of his body. Her attentions have transformed this aggressive creature into the gentlest of giants.
He drapes a forelimb lightly over her shoulder, gently pulling her beneath him. This young female is one of the last to mate. Soon she must decide where to lay her eggs and her decision will be profoundly influenced by the weather. Each year the pattern of wet seasons in the north of Australia is similar, but no two are ever the same. This year the heavy rains came and went quickly, but late in the season they returned. The unexpected downpour presents few problems for most crocs along the river because their nests lie above the rising water. But a few aren't so lucky. Our female's territory has flooded, presenting her with a dilemma. Does she wait for the waters to recede or does she look elsewhere for a safer place to nest? Beyond the river, the rains have thrown open a door to another world. It is a vast labyrinth of flooded plains and lakes. And as the rainstorms continue, the water rises even higher. The late rains are brief, but heavy. The flood peaks nine feet up the trunks of gum trees, but almost immediately begins draining back into the river. The deluge takes its toll, drowning the nests of thousands of birds. It's a disastrous beginning to the breeding season for one of Crocodile Territory's best known residents. Each year, more than a million pairs of magpie geese breed out on the floodplain. They first began to build their nests when it seemed the worst storms had passed. But the unexpected weather took them by surprise. Perched on their nests, they found the floodwaters rising around them. Magpie geese, like most wildlife in crocodile territory, synchronize breeding with the wet season and the flush of new growth that follows. But if there's a disaster like a late flood, they are able to breed again if there's enough time. It's late in the season, but the magpie geese are making a second attempt at nesting. Some have already laid more eggs. The male geese do most of the nest duty, tending to eggs and chicks. But with even the closest attention, will they be able to recoup their earlier losses? Time is also working against our female Salty. She now leaves the river and begins her search for a nesting territory beyond its banks out on the floodplain. She follows deep freshwater channels that give way to a world of vivid clarity. Refreshed by the rains, the clear water is a relief from the silt-laden murk of the river.
Weaving her way through a forest of paperbark trees, she follows a path carved by the river long ago, a time before it altered its meandering course. Some sections of these ghost rivers left behind on the floodplain are very deep. In Australia, they're called billabongs, and billabongs are a haven for crocodiles. It is here that she will lay her eggs, but first she must find and secure a territory. The billabong holds the key to survival, not just for crocodiles, but for all the wildlife around here. When the wet season ends, it will be many months before any further rains fall, and many water holes on the floodplains will vanish. Behind a flotilla of Australian pelicans, the giant leaves of the red lotus lily are a good indication of permanent water. But the water level remains a little too high where the female salty has claimed her territory beside some paper bark trees. So the female waits. With extra long toes to spread its weight, the comb crested jacana appears to walk on water. The pied heron is not so well equipped. This kind of behavior seems highly dangerous given what might be lurking just beneath the surface. A crocodile's hunger varies with the time of year. As the wet season draws to an end, it brings cooler temperatures, which suppress their appetites. For the time being, many in the billabong will be spared. During the days that follow, just enough rain falls to maintain the water level a few critical inches above the female's needs. Finally, she senses that the time is right. She moves through her territory with the stealth of an expert huntress. Today, feeding isn't on her mind. In the shade of the paper bark trees, she goes to work. She scrapes together a mixture of leaf litter, fragments of bark, and humus rich soil. At last, she begins to build her nest. Getting the right blend of ingredients is very important. If the nest becomes a compost heap, her embryos will be destroyed. Without sufficient heat, they won't develop. And if there aren't enough air spaces, they will suffocate. Salties build the biggest nest mounds of all crocs. It could be four or five days before she's completely satisfied with her work. Or she may abandon this mound and build another. Whatever happens, she must lay soon. The embryos within her are maturing. Now that the rains have all but ceased, the water in the billabong is becoming a thickening soup savored by the royal spoonbills. 
They sift the water through a strainer at the end of their bills, filtering out a rich haul of tiny aquatic animals. Her nest complete, the salty waits, but not for long. Finally, several weeks after mating, our young female begins to lay. The eggs of a first clutch are generally small, and she will lay fewer than an older female. Even so, within an hour, she will have deposited 30 eggs within the mound. At the outset, she enters a placid, hypnotic state. But after egg laying is completed, the young female will be anything but docile. For the next three months, her nest beside the paper bark trees will become the center of her existence and she will defend it vigorously. Now that the rains have ceased and the flow back into the rivers is steadily shrinking, time is running out for those who depend on water. Schools of rainbow fish, purple-spotted grungeons, and many others will now fight their way back upriver. They must reach the permanent water of the billabongs before the dry season closes off their escape route. The migration takes place in waves. Solid columns pulse through the wetlands' arteries, hugging the bank where progress is easier. Egrets and herons know their roots and are waiting. Though there's plenty for all, they still squabble over the best fishing positions. In crocodile territory, a season of abundance is followed by one of scarcity. And long ago, the birds discovered how best to maneuver through both. The fish that survive either find their way up the main rivers or into the stationary waters of the billabongs. Here they wait out the dry season. They will form the breeding nucleus next year when the rains return. When it's time, their offspring will spill out onto the floodplain, repopulating every corner of crocodile territory. If our females' eggs have survived, they are now very close to hatching. For 90 days, she's been so vigilant, she hasn't eaten. As the dry season closes in, the water level in the billabong drops. It's become an oasis, drawing animals in from the desiccated floodplain. More and more large crocodiles now congregate in the shrinking waters, 
making the billabong a less than ideal place to raise a young family. Staying close to her nest, our young female listens closely to the evening chorus. Tonight, there are new voices. She responds immediately to calls coming from within the mound. All of the hatchlings must leave the nest tonight. Many will need her assistance to break free from the compacted mound. Working quickly, she also helps release those still trapped within their eggs. Despite the apparent rough handling, the hatchling is unharmed. It pulls at the membrane attached to the shell. But now, comes the delicate part of this operation. The female's jaws can crush prey with bone-shattering pressure, but she gently mouths the hatchlings and carries them to the waterline. It takes her several hours to move the entire brood to the safety of the rushes. Some hatchlings appear uncooperative, perhaps mistaking the female's intentions. look of the newly hatched crocs comes from the yolk sac inside their bodies. As it's depleted, they will become leaner. The sex of her hatchlings was determined by the incubation temperature within the mound. Below 88 degrees Fahrenheit, more females are produced, but above 90 degrees, there are more males. During this temperate season, her nest has probably produced both male and female offspring. Barely one in a hundred young salties live to the age of five. But at least for the next few months, these youngsters can rely on their mother's care and protection. In fact, their chances of survival began to increase many weeks ago when their mother set off on her journey here from the tidal river. Young crocs that hatch near the sea can risk dehydration and have difficulty purging salt from their bloodstream on their first swim. It should be safer here, at least for those that the mother can keep concealed among the reeds. Unlike the crocodile, the green tree frog offers no protection to its young, and the masses of tadpoles that have spawned in the billabong will be food for all. Their formula for survival assumes high losses. 
these young frogs are far less likely to make it to adulthood than even the young salty. For the first few days, the hatchlings eat very little. They snap at everything that moves. But at first, it's a little more than a reflex. The true character of the salty starts to emerge once the remains of the yolk sac inside it run out. To lie in wait and pounce is a hunting technique hatchlings know from the outset. Throughout their long history on Earth, crocodiles have clung to the water's edge and to a way of life that's made them remarkably successful both as predators and survivors. From the moment they enter the water, hatchlings respond to instincts honed by their ancestors millions of years ago. Despite the earlier floods, the local magpie geese have also been fortunate. Goslings are now emerging from their nests in healthy numbers. But the geese may yet pay the price for late breeding. By the time these chicks fledge and make their way to the floodplain, the wild rice that sustains them may be gone scorched by the swelling heat of the dry season. Even their time here is risky. Despite the careful attentions of the adults, chicks are easy targets for many predators of the billabong. The Jabiru stork is nearly six feet tall. Its prominent bill makes a formidable dagger, ideal for spearing a variety of prey, including small crocodiles. As long as they stay close to their mother, hatchlings have little to fear. But like all youngsters, they will begin to strike out on their own. Some will pay the price for their curiosity. Of all the dangers facing hatchlings in the billabong, the greatest is of the crocodiles. Every day the youngsters grow more independent. There's little the mother can do to keep them together once they begin to explore their territory. They begin to hunt beyond the reeds, choosing progressively larger prey. The water surface is the target zone for the billabong's other major predator, the barramundi. Barramundi are spectacular fish. They can grow five feet long and weigh up to 120 pounds. They strike with explosive speed.
In the crocodile world, there is no taboo against cannibalism. Most of these animals will eat their share of hatchlings. The hazards of billabong life soon begin to outweigh its advantages. Most hatchlings raised here will stay and take their chances. But a few tiny explorers find their way out onto the floodplain. The dry season has turned the area into a confounding maze of shrinking streams and transient ponds. And the adventurers that have set out for the river could easily be heading toward a dead end. Released from her maternal responsibilities, the female begins to enjoy her freedom. She's caught a file snake. Having snared a territory here in the Billabong, this is where she'll remain. Her role in determining the fate of her offspring is now over. The blistering heat creates unexpected opportunities. In the shallows, there are dead barramundi. As the billabong becomes depleted of oxygen, many large fish suffocate. As the weeks pass, the dry season claims many victims. The magpie geese have abandoned the scorched grass of the floodplain and begin to gather back at the billabong. The adults are accompanied by the season's young, now fully grown. The billabong offers the geese more than just a place to cool off. Buried in the mud near the water's edge are the bulbs of water plants. They are swollen and nutritious after the growing season. And now that the water levels have fallen, they are more accessible. The geese are too plump and well-fed, and the salties numerous and hungry. Burying one's head in the mud is risky business. virtue crocodiles have mastered, reaps its rewards. Satiated on a season of plenty, the unfortunate goose has become just another link in the food chain.
powerful gastric juices quickly dissolve flesh and bone, but feathers take longer to digest. Croc's stomachs are surprisingly small, and the feathers will soon fill the available space. This will limit the salty's ability to feed again until they've been digested. But as the dry season grips the billabong, there will be little but goose on the menu for months to come. Two million magpie geese and their offspring are now concentrating around the scatter of shrinking water holes. And until the rains come, they will cling desperately to these oases. The flow of water across the floodplain has stopped. The remaining streams trickle into ponds that lead nowhere. Yet a few hatchlings still try valiantly to leave the billabong. This little salty is unaware that whatever lies ahead is far more dangerous than what he's left behind. Finding deeper water offers hope of a way out, but it's a trap. These temporary water holes are popular dry season hunting grounds for herons and egrets. Soon, even these water holes will dry up. To be caught in them is certain death, one way or another. Fortunately for the young crocodile, there's far more food here than the birds can possibly eat. Before the water disappears, the heat and loss of oxygen take the lives of many small creatures. The air becomes heavy with a stench of rotting fish that form a thick carpet over the drying mud. Every animal has a selfish interest in survival. But the flame seems to burn brighter in some individuals than others. Passing on beyond this vanishing oasis, the hatchling could die of dehydration in the punishing heat. But staying here would mean almost certain death. To survive the ages, crocs had to develop strong instincts. Can it be that some primal urge drives them on?
The flush of green that clings to the edge of the water hole will soon wither. And like the hatchling, the agile wallaby will also need to flee to stay alive. These two strangers in the grass share a common destiny. The dry season which has brought them together may conspire to defeat them both. Far from the water, a short-necked turtle is baffled by a sea of mirages. The searing mud scorches its feet. For the turtle to survive, it too must continue its quest for water. The cloud buildup brings only an astonishing electrical display. Relief is on its way. But the fantastic tableaus of lightning that now fill the skies play one final cruel trick on the parched landscape. The animals of crocodile territory have lived with fire for as long as they've lived with floodwaters. Seasons of deluge and flames have alternated here for many thousands of years. In the smoky skies, scavengers hover. Kites have come to prey on the dead and hunt the weak. This is no place for our young traveler. The short-necked turtle has reached the end of the road. Already it's been picked over by predators. There's not much left for the half-starved guana. By the end of the dry season, corpses will litter the floodplain. When a pond dries up around a large salty, the croc can either walk to water or bury itself in mud, awaiting the rains. Either way, few survive the ordeal. Hatchling continues his search for water, unaware that water may yet find him. At last, a final curtain of dense cloud is drawn across the long dry. The rain infuses the earth with the powerful pulse of life. And the rewards for extreme survival strategies now pay off. Buried alive for months, 
A long-necked turtle must now make up for the lost time. Against considerable odds, our hatchling has completed his desperate dash from the billabong. Now, he must find permanent water. In the rain-flushed billabong, salties are answering the mating call. The females are fertile. And the males are beginning, once again, to vie for the right to breed. Though their struggles are vicious and bloody, the new plant growth adds a touch of comedy to some courtship patrols. Our female has found her niche here in the billabong. And for the first time in months, the river receives floodplain water. And riding in its currents is a very determined refugee. It joins a clutch of young riverside salties whose struggle to survive has really only just begun. Seasons of flood, fire, and drought make crocodile territory a tough proving ground. But given their amazing history, if we dare imagine what kind of creature will survive the next 200 million years, this might be it. <laughs> <laughs>